Welcome to another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, and today the with is Chris Harrington. Chris, can you uh, start by telling us a little bit about yourself? I sure can, Michael. Um, again, I'm Chris Harrington. I'm the founder of the Institute for Teaching and Leading, and I also serve as the director for Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. And um, in my organization, well, actually, I, I was a teacher for uh, 11 years, a school district administrator for another 15 years, and have been in helping schools as a consultant uh, for almost a decade. And um, so at the Institute for Teaching and Leading, for example, we help schools make shifts to transformative or innovative learning models, however they define that. And we do that through consulting, thought partnership, professional development, and we also have a, uh, an educational research arm as well. Um, okay. It's interesting, at, at the moment, we're, um, we're doing work with um, helping some schools with their rapid transition to emergency teaching, not to be confused with online learning, because I, I think there's a distinct difference there. Um, but this emergency teaching piece, uh, we're helping schools, but um, we're also looking at a longer term picture of a learning continuity. So this is a very timely uh, session to record here. Very good, very good. Now, you mentioned doing professional development with teachers, and I know even with the helping the folks with the, the transition to emergency teaching, you've been doing work with teachers there. Um, what are some tips that you'd provide to folks that, um, depending on where they're living now, might be just starting this up this week, or they might have been doing it for a couple of weeks now, but they're still brand new to it, haven't been really been trained in it and have really been thrown into the deep end. Um, what's some advice you'd have for them? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I guess the first thing is don't panic. We're going to get through this. Because um, I know this can be really stressful. And actually, Michael, I've heard different stories from different teachers. Um, some folks have just made this shift so seamless because they're heavy users of technology. They're working in either an online or a blended format already. And that's great. Um, most of us aren't like that, though. Most of us have a, a real strong connection to the face-to-face -face environment. And regardless of how much experience we have, we have to understand there's a difference here um, in what's happening in the homes of kids right now. This is a stressful time. So under normal circumstances, yeah, there might be some students who are uh, very accustomed and familiar with learning remotely, um, but this is different now. Now you have all, all these bodies crammed into a household. It's mom, it's dad, it could be an aunt and uncle, siblings, and they're all in this environment that they weren't necessarily um, comfortable doing or used to doing for extended periods of time. So. You know, I think as a teacher, one of, the th one of the most important things that we can do is make sure you stay connected to the kids and to the families. It's, it's an abnormal structure and a routine for kids right now. So you as a teacher, if you can create any kind of semblance of, of normalcy for the kids, I think that's huge. And, and that's through you know, staying connected. And it's not just through email or maybe messages through a learning management system. You know, if there's any way that you can have some more personal connections, whether it's through video conference or even if you're, you have content that you're, that you're putting up online through like a Google Classroom or Canvas, Schoology, D2L, and Brightspace, you know, however you do that, if you can get your image on there, maybe it's a video or at least have them hear your voice, that'll certainly help and it can, it can help reestablish that human relationship that we know is so critical in a classroom. You know, so I, I would say that's that's an important thing. And as I mentioned before, you know, this what we're talking about right now in our current COVID-19 situation is this is emergency teaching is what it is. It, it's not online learning. So we have to be realistic with what we can expect. In an online learning environment, once you have a had extensive professional development, know how to architect a, a, a course and a learning experience in a fully online environment, you know, and your, your, your program or your skills mature, that's a whole different story. Um, and and you, can, you can expect more from that kind of an experience. I think right now, one of the things that we need to do is we need to manage those expectations about what we can actually do. We can still do things. We have to be careful about how much we're, we're asking of folks. So I guess one of the things would be, I, I think we need to reframe time, okay? When we have students in a, in a physical building in a classroom for six hours a day, I don't think we can expect six hours a day of engagement from a child in a home in this kind of a situation. So I think as a teacher, we find that things just seem to take longer. 
whether it's communication, because you send an email to a student or a message to a student, it's going to take a little while for them to get back to you. And those communications are drawn out. Okay, those asynchronous communications, because there's no body language, you're asking for clarification. It's not a normal way that we communicate all the time. So that takes longer. But then I think we also have to think about time in terms of imagine a household that has three kids. And in that household, there's also some adults and everybody needs technology. How much technology is actually in the home? Well, that could vary. In a perfect world, everybody has their own device and they have the bandwidth at home on an internet connectivity that there's no issues there. Um, that's often not the case. Sometimes they're sharing on their distractions. And when it comes time to um, work on assignments or even, even submitting um, assessments, all of these things may take longer because we don't know exactly when kids are going to have the availability and the access to the technology they need. And, um, and I think it's also something that, that, that needs to be discussed is the fact that as teachers, we're as teachers now needing to be in our own homes working. We may be caregivers of our own children. And we have the UPS or Amazon delivering things to our door. We have dogs barking in the background. There are all these different things that come up that you know, a teacher's availability might be different as well. So maybe the best time for a teacher to, in all practical senses, is to, to actually work with kids is going to be responding to communications, say, after nine o'clock at night. You know, so, so all these things have to be accounted for and, and, and things pretty much stretch out. Um, so that being said, when we talk about curriculum and actually um, you know, we recognize the, the realities of, of kids working at home, teachers working at home, understanding that we need to manage our expectations with time. When we look at how we're actually delivering content, my, I guess the biggest advice I would have to be um, the content that is provided, the new learning that occurs, that comes from teachers, should be scaled to match those expectations. And, and I think probably the best advice I could give would be sure that what you as a teacher are doing is in alignment with what your school or district expects. Um, some schools and districts um, are expecting more than others. Uh, so, so really understanding that, have a conversation with your school leader um, or district level leader, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I guess for the most part though, um, what, what I see a lot of schools doing is they're really paring down the essential content. You can't teach everything, okay? Remember, rethinking that and reaming that time. Um, as far as content goes also, digital means are great, but not all kids have access to the technology or the internet to, to leverage any technology that they might have in the house. So being mindful of that and, and scaling um, those expectations based on some of those realities is really important. Um, I, and I know there's a big push for use of digital tools, which is great. I, I'm a huge supporter of that. Um, but I would recommend for anybody moving into this kind of an environment that's a change for a lot of people, in particular the kids, use familiar tools. Just because you saw something's free on the internet, this company's offering that, that company's offering that, don't just go grabbing all these shiny things. Do what you know is going to work. Remember, teachers, as professionals, you make the best call for your kids, okay? And you also need to make the, the right kind of call for the tools that you can use to be a great teacher. I've seen technology be forced in, a, in online environments where it's like, well, this is a great tool. I'm going to find a way to make it work, you know? And there's some casualties that go along with that sometimes. And, and sometimes uh, there's some ineffective teaching that occurs. Stick with what's familiar for both you and your kids. I think that's um, that, that's my piece of advice from a from a curricular content. And I guess the last item would be um, remember this is education is has been and is always about relationships, you know, between teachers and students and parents. And um, if I were in a position where I were a teacher, the one thing I would make my number one priority every day is wellness checks check in with the kids, have that personal connection in those communications. And I, I like to go back to Stephen Covey, Covey's um, quote, 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So focusing on that and making sure that um, the kids and the families are okay, I think will actually open the doors for, uh, for you to actually be effective to whatever degree teaching occurs in your school or district. Very good. Now, you mentioned parents there at the end. Mm -hmm. We've got a, a lot of parents that, uh, while they're always a partner in the educational system, um, we're asking a lot more of them now, or at least they are being thrust with a lot of new responsibilities that they wouldn't have had, say, a month mm -hmm. or a month and a half ago. Um, any advice that you'd have for them on how they can sort of manage this uncertain situation? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was a parent of two online learners. They both, both grew fully online programs. And um, it, it's a different kind of a thing going on at home when you're, uh, when you're working in a fully online environment. Now, my home, actually, this is my office now, but this was my kid's workspace. So we had a formal place for the kids to work, and it was very structured. And, you know, under normal circumstances, you know, things are things were pretty good here, but there was always some some strains because it was a new learning model for them in the beginning. But certainly now, you know, when when all kids are moving online or, or moving to a remote learning environment, um, especially with the stress that goes along with a pandemic, I think one of those parents would would really help kids with would be having open and honest conversations about what is going on. And uh, because there's this underlying stress at the at the very Maslow level, you know, um, how do you, how do you get kids past that kind of a thing so that they're actually ready to to learn? Um, so having those conversations um, as appropriate, nobody knows the kids better than the parents. So um, there shouldn't be like a, a something that the, that the teachers can really do in a very um, uh, impactful way without the help of parents. So I think that's a that's a really important piece. Um, but then I also think that um, I may mention that this was my kids' learning environment in the past. Um, having some structure within the household to make room for education, because typically when kids go off to a traditional brick and mortar environment, and then when they come, you know that, that that's where school occurs. Then when they come home. Yeah, there's homework and sometimes it's done in front of the TV or laying on the bed in the evening or something like that. If all schooling is going to occur like this now, you know, during a pandemic or during the, the time of extended school closures, there needs to be a different kind of a plan in place probably. And, and I would argue that um, if, if routines were established, and I'm talking about times for kids to be working, okay, this is school time. This is play time. This is family time. So having those kinds of routines or the, the routine of time is really important. And it's even probably even more important if you're sharing devices and technology. Uh, but then the learning environment itself. Um, if, you know, if there's a lot of activity buzzing around the dining room table and, and a child's there working on some, some coursework or taking an assessment, it's probably not the best environment for that student. So what, what does that learning environment look like and how can you as a parent structure that? Um, if you don't know the answer to that as a parent, contact the teacher because the teacher will gladly help. The teacher has some experience with doing this. Um, so um, I would also say um, another thing a parent could do in terms of providing structure um, would be um, having these kinds of routines for, for the simple purpose, if for no other reason, just to create some level of predictability in the kids' lives because you know, their their routines have been disrupted. But if there is some structure now and a schedule, that can create some predictability in a time of uncertainty. It can actually help manage the household a little bit better if it's uh, if it's feeling a little chaotic at home. Um, <laughs> that might actually be a, some good advice for teachers as well uh, who are working at home. <laughs> um, and I think um, another thing there in terms of structure would be, um, you know, making sure that there are expectations that are set. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that if there aren't any expectations and if education, if, if time isn't allocated for education and the expectations to do good work on the part of the kids, if that's not set, I have a pretty good feeling that it's not going to happen on its own. So setting those expectations with, um, coming from the parents would be a great idea. Um, now, when I, when I say expectations, also recognizing the fact that this isn't school. It's not a school environment. And, and those expectations 
will probably need to be managed a little bit too and avoid some of that overload um, for kids. Um, I mentioned before, having kids online for six hours a day, I don't know any online learner who does that. Um, even the fully online schools um, with, with fully online programs, six hours a day, that's a lot of time. Even for a high school senior, um, think about what that means for a first grader or a second grader or a third grader, right? So there's, um, there's, there's appropriate levels of screen time and, and time on task there. And downtime is okay. Um, in fact, you know, if, if there's any opportunities uh, for communications that are non-school related, certainly communications with the teacher is a great thing, but, but even expanding communications with family members or friends of, of the child, um, if you as a parent could actually help encourage some of that, it kind of keeps those four walls in your home from kind of feeling like they're, they're squeezing in on you. Connect with the outside world. It's a it's a great way to help support um, a bit of a sanity, um, for lack of a better word here. Um, and you know, I was uh, talking to somebody yesterday, and um, it was about parents and and what what can parents do at home. So I can't take credit for this. Actually, um, you know this gentleman, Mark Deshane. Um, Mark Deshane um, shared this with me yesterday. He said, you know, this is a great time to just seize the opportunity for some family time. If it's high pressure at home and chaotic and the, the, the learning experience isn't a good one and tensions are high, that's really not where you want to be. Like I said, downtime's okay. Get the work done that you need to get done. But wow, what a great opportunity that we have right now for families to be able to actually spend some good quality time together. However, that that works in, in a particular household, you know, it's um, I see it as an opportunity. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning, today with Chris Harrington. Thank you, Michael.